What? There's a scarf of it. Did you know that someone did a scarf of it? There's a football scarf of it, which I have nothing to do with. And like, I was doing something and someone, oh, I bought your scarf. I went, what? <laughs> they thought I'm like a, a scarf millionaire now. But there's a, it looks like an England football scarf. And it's got, if you say you're English, you get thrown in jail these days. Hello. Thank you all for joining. Please like and subscribe. I'm, Beyond honoured to have a man who needs, I would say, no introduction, but I'll just say the formidable comedian Stuart Lee. Stuart, it's such an honour to have you here. Thank you very much for having me. It's really nice to see you, and it's nice to talk to people as well. <laughs> Not, I know, it's, like, I... it's like going out. So it's good. Tell me how yeah. you're coping in that, because I, I talk to my cats a lot. How are you getting through this? Well, cats, I mean, actually, we've got, we've got three cats, and... um they have been invaluable in that they've sort of they create their own little narrative of their adventures and relationships which takes your mind off things i've been i've been all right i'm one of those um uh uh working from home types who actually has a guilty pleasure of enjoying the first lockdown really I, and i felt terrible about it but i liked the silence i like being able to smell the flowers and hear the birds and not see the planes and walk long distances across empty London and then obviously the death toll is now insurmountably appalling having worked five nights a week for most of my the last 30 years I am going a bit stir crazy and I worry obviously you know I'm lost I've lost a number of people to the uh, knock-on effects of COVID um and uh and also um you know one 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 fears for the things you like most about life and when they will come when they'll come back obviously i I'm, I'm probably not going to be working for you know it's like a two year block almost out of out of doing live work and i worry about how music and comedy will come back um with music with the added knock on effects of the economic problems caused by brexit you know it's um yeah it's starting to uh starting to you know, I'm I'm economically insulated against it in a way, because my tour went down halfway through, so I'm I was working, but um, yeah, it's, a, it's a starting to not not it's starting to be difficult to find anything positive about it, really. How about you? Yeah, I mean, I'm you see, I was I know lots of people like that in the first lockdown. They were like, well, come yeah, on, yeah. we get a different pace of life. The yeah, air yeah. was cleaner. I noticed that it was a, it was significant. It was it was like being in the countryside. Yeah. Uh, it was so quiet and all the rest of it. But I never, I struggled ever to see. I mean, obviously, we, you know, it was a, it's a horrific national ca catastrophe. Yeah. But I, I always just found it because I hate solitude. I hate writing, and that's my job. I appreciate. I've probably got the wrong gig there. <laughs> but, but the bit of it I did like was chatting to people. And yeah, so, you know, when I'm researching a book, I interview, I go and meet people, I travel about, I get. And I just found like being trapped in a flat with my own stupid thoughts. Yeah. I mean, well, I well, I also think. I mean, you're you're a a, a frontline participant in the culture war, and I feel like that's we'll that's been you. happening in a kind of insane bubble where um, lots of things have been said that have no kind of practical application to the world because we're all isolated. And I, I you know, when I, when I the, the last tour. Which I will resume at some point. I've got about seventy dates left of it. The, you know, the, I wrote it at the back end of two thousand and nineteen, and the first half of it was sort of about the culture war. You know, and if I were to put that that back on the road now, it'd be a nostalgic look at two thousand and nineteen, which was already seems like a more civilized, um, less intense time in terms of how that debate was going on so you know it was been... weird isn't it in terms of that i mean I'll, we'll, we'll come back to a bit about yeah, yeah. After, a bit later on but yeah. i just it, it seemed to be this iron law from basically 2015 onwards that however bad you think things are things can always get a lot worse and 2019 yeah. just seen them out. like by then it was like this is getting ridiculous and silly and yeah and then the world collapsed yeah so turns out there is still a long way, and then it's this year begins. Way. It can't be worse, and then there's yeah. a the town in the United States. <laughs> yeah, it's like the Sam Kinison line. I've, I can't even remember what routine it's in, but he goes, "We've hit another layer. Let's keep digging." <laughs> yes. It does feel like that. You know? <laughs> <It's so true. laughs> 
just before we talk about stuff like that, um, I want to talk about your new film, uh, King Rocker, which is a genuine masterpiece. It was it's very kind to say that it was it was done with um, me and Michael Cumming uh, directed it and edited it all in his shed, so he deserves a great amount of credit for that. So, Mike yeah. in your shed, here's yeah. to both you, your shed, and your yeah. talent. Um, just tell me, this is about the Nightingales. It's, it's a really fascinating. Uh, documentary. It's full of humanity and warmth, but it's it's, it's got lots of la- it's layers, lots of layers. Just tell me, tell us about how it how it came about and what well, kind of what you were trying to do with it. Almost. Well, when I was a kid, like lots of uh, men of my age, I used to listen to the John Peel show, and the Nightingales were on it all the time, and they were uh, from Birmingham where I grew up, and I really liked them, and I liked the words, and I found them very inspiring. Um, uh, they uh, had a comedian on their record label called Ted Chippington, who's the reason that I do stand up. And um, then w- when they re- they sort of they they were in various kind of manifestations. They disappeared for about ten ten years, and when they came back in the noughties, Rob Lloyd, the singer, had heard that I was a fan and asked me to open for them, uh, which I, I wouldn't normally do that, but I did it because Ted used to open for them, so it seemed. Fair enough. And um, then I got to know him. And about 10 years ago, he said to me, you know, could could you make a documentary about the Nightingales, a bit like the Anvil documentary, which is about a sort of unlucky heavy metal band. Um, And I said, well, yeah, I don't think it should be like that, though, because I think the Nightingales are one of the great post-punk bands. Um, And so I, I spent about seven years trying to figure out how to do this. Obviously, you know, you know, you know what it's like. You, you take ideas to broadcasters; they're not interested if it, if it's someone they haven't heard of. Um, everything now is commissioned by sort of algorithms, so it's how do things relate to one another. So, if you've got a genuine new idea or an, an outsider that's not been written about, it's quite hard to land them. Also, I would probably have found myself replaced in it by some younger person with a better. Uh, in Instagram following and um <laughs> so you know it we just wasn't really getting anywhere and then by a weird coincidence I found out that Michael Cumming who's a director who did Brass Eye and Toast of London who'd done the pilot of my comedy vehicle series was a big Nightingales fan this was about three years ago and I said to him do you want to try and make a film about the Nightingales um and we'll just do it ourselves so we raised a bit of money by doing um three uh we did about three shows where we uh i did stand up work in progress and he showed a film he'd made about brass eye and you know about five six hundred people came to them and we got that money in and we did a bit of little bit of crowdfunding and some very strange people donated um and you know we just got on with it really we paid we had about 12 days filming with a crew we had to pay the rest of it there's such warmth towards Rob Lloyd, the singer of the group and the group itself, that lots of people helped out for nothing. We realised pretty quickly that it was going to have to be a story about Rob. Um, and then I remembered when I was a kid being interested in this forgotten statue of King Kong in Birmingham City Centre that was abandoned but has now been kind of critically rehabilitated by the Henry Moore Institute. And I thought that would make a good counterpoint to the story of Rob. And the film came together. We finished it. Uh, Michael had learned to edit. He edited it in his shed in uh, Northamptonshire, in his garden. He finished it in March. We were going to tour it around cinemas to make the money back. Lots of little art cinemas were interested. It was going to be in the Sheffield Documentary Festival. And then the COVID came. I don't know if you've noticed that. Oh, so we couldn't. We couldn't. Happened. We couldn't tour it around. Um, we tried to place it with broadcasters again mainly to bafflement and lack of interest. And then, bizarrely, uh, Sky Arts, which is now free to air, have taken it up, and it's on the 6th of February, Saturday night, on Sky Arts at 9pm. And that is the nuts and bolts of it. Now you have to ask questions about the textual nature of it. Well, as you know, I'm a very high-profile cultural critic. Uh, it's my bread and butter. Um, I mean, it's interesting because it did. Obviously, I instantly thought of Anvil, the story of Anvil, which I, which I loved. It was a great. Yeah. That's, that's a great documentary. But I, I, I mean, I preferred this. I mean, partly because, as you said, I mean, Anvil were the. They were, no offense. I mean, they know this. They did a documentary about it. They never achieved 
stardom. They ne- they were the, the heavy metal yeah. band that never that never made it. And the Nightingales, who I confess I didn't know much about. No one does, uh, yeah. Um, that I'd heard of. Yeah. Um, that you know, obviously they they were in a, in a different league. I mean, I'm really interested because Rob, Lott, I loved the guy. I thought he was you know. Um, instantly liked him instantly liked yeah. him we'll see why what I thought was interesting he's from a you know he's a working class um, musician and you know pop music was driven so much by working class artists yeah in from working class communities yeah and I remember I, I don't know if it was Jarvis Cocker or some member of Pulp um, talking about this um, which was that it was it was possible before the kind of attack on the welfare state and so on, for aspiring musicians and other artists, not just musicians, comedians, uh, you know, and, and artists of different kinds, that they could support themselves and then, you know, be be able to hopefully aspire to their dream of becoming, a, 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 you know, a, 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 a band that makes it. And yeah, yeah. that's become so much harder now. And, yeah. and you know, a lot of... If you look now, the evidence, the statistics show about music, pop culture, the number of people from privately educated backgrounds, and only 7% of people go to private schools, but they're disproportionately represented. People from more privileged backgrounds, that that kind of tradition of Rob Lloyd is in decline, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, I have to flag something up here now, which is, there was not, there was not a, stre- a stretched imagination by which you could say I was working class, although I'm not as middle class as people slagging me off on the internet like to think. <laughs> but I, but then in some ways, that what I, what we hoped to get from the film was a, a, tr- a tribute to that sort of period, and I think it started to go wrong in the early '90s, where um, all sorts of factors conspire to provide um, a sort of safety net for people trying to pursue. Uh, careers in the arts from um, less privileged backgrounds. First of all, you know, you had housing benefit, you had squats. If you went to college, uh, you didn't come out with a huge debt. Um, you had the enterprise allowance scheme, bizarrely, which um, which uh, Thatcher introduced to try and massage the unemployment figures. And every stand-up I knew in the 80s when I started out was on enterprise allowance. Michael Cumming, our director, was on enterprise allowance as a director. You had to prove that you had some cultural ambition and you could uh, you could apply for it. And Jeff Dyer uh, wrote a great piece that I think I read, uh, I forget where it was, but it was about how, for him, the 80s was a kind of, postgraduate course and he you know he lived in a, in a squat in Brixton with all sorts of people trying to do different sorts of things all influencing each other and um this that that sort of atmosphere was there I thought it was particularly ironic when Boris Johnson was mayor of London there was some anniversary of punk the 30th anniversary or whatever and he was talking I remember seeing him talk about the great contribution London made to this brilliant cultural phenomenon and of course there's no way that cultural phenomena could have happened in a London were with uh, such reduced um, available housing stock, uh, with so many uh, massive overheads, um, and uh, with, with with such a sort of uh, difficult lifestyle for artists, and you know that's again Jarvis Cocker writing in Common People is very much about how people from a particular kind of background were able to have access to to the arts. So I, I was just on a a podcast with um, Andy Miller about books blacklisted and we were looking at the bloater by Rosemary Tonks which is a sort of look at the art scene of London in the mid to late 60s and what really dates it is the fact that everyone in the art scene in London at that point is still from a privileged background and obviously rock and roll was going to blow that open and change everything and uh, and after that point it wasn't the case. Um, I'm a patron of Josie Long's charity, um, Arts Emergency, which is about trying to encourage people from different sorts of backgrounds to study uh, uh, arts at university level and in further education, because they do need this diversity of voices. And um, Rob's a really great example of someone who in that period was able to subsist and get by. And, um, and you know, we, we've, we've, we're losing these sorts of voices from the culture and so I, I you know i hope on some level the doc, the documentary does serve as a kind of um a, a, a record of that of that time i was really i mean what what was fascinating about it is of course unlike anvil nightingales did have huge amounts yeah. of success relatively but you know rob himself he after that huge success he went through periods of quite quite a protracted period of struggle mental health struggles it looks like it yeah although although you know i'm not I'm not a journalist and I knew as a writer, I knew the film needed, you know, it needed that 
well, well, I've I've since realised that unconsciously it follows the model of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, which is in so many stories from King Arthur, you know, great myths, the Lord of the Rings, everything, loads of Italian westerns. There has to be a bit. There's the struggle, the success, and then there's a bit where it all goes wrong, and some equilibrium has to be clawed back. There's obviously a ten or fifteen year bit where it really went wrong for Rob, and a proper journalist would have um would have nailed that, would have gone deeper into it. But I am a human, first and all, first and foremost, <laughs> before I may. And I couldn't really bring myself to force the issue on that. But what Michael did that was very clever was got Rob to talk to his son um, and to Bridget Christie, my wife, who's a fan of the group, about that sort of period. So we did kind of, we did get get some of what had gone wrong. Not not as much as I would have liked. And there were there were probably, I mean, there was a story involving him jumping out of a moving car with a, a bag of cash that I was never quite able to, having to sort of escape from someone, <laughs> I thought I was never really able to work out exactly what it was or how it fitted in. Um, but, you know, there, there was that, there was that, bit there's the that that bit in it the dark bit um so i'm glad you were able to see that was there without it, it being that. explicit yeah. yeah no no no. it was so, very subtly done but it was woven in yeah um and people must watch it and it is is part a lot of it's like intruding on this hilarious conversation between <laughs> two very good mates that's how it, it you know it, well, it's, it's 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 and so please do watch it well, I mean, you know you know what's nice about that was it was that i mean i i did three comedy panel shows in the mid noughties when I was really broke. And what I didn't like about those was that um, people are trying to step on your head, you know, that they, they, they want to have the last word because that's how they get the point. It's rather how in the same way as everyone in the Tories conducts political interviews. Now they're sort of looking for a bit that can be chopped out uh, irrespective of what happens around it, you know, and, um, and, and, uh, so th th there was never, there wasn't really any cooperation in those. There was never a feeling of the, the good, the, the the greater whole of trying to get the, the laugh for the show rather than for the individual. But in conversation with Rob, um, the, the conversations are really funny in a way that they're not on panel shows uh, yeah. because they're just some people laughing generously um, at each other. Um, and, uh, and so it, it, people have really said that about it that it's fun to watch people just really laughing at things each other are saying rather than it being this sort of peacock display of wit. And exactly. um, I think it's particularly good at the moment because there's, there's loads of footage in it of people in pubs, packed pubs, laughing and drinking and being nice to each other. It's so terrible. <laughs> you think, oh, God, when will we be able to go? You live near the Lexington, don't you? I do, yeah. yeah like, that's where like, you had your horrible thing, got, wasn't it? it? Being up by Nazis. Yeah, are you all right now? Oh, yeah, yeah, totally yeah, fine. Yeah. I'm, t I'm tougher than I look, which is a very, very low bar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I like so, I mean, the next thing is I think of a lot when I think of what can't you do. I actually think of the upper room of the Lexington, where, you know, as being one of my happy places, a room full of people all looking at a stage drinking, you know. I mean, that's, you know what? I I mean, it's funny the Lexington. I should emphasise because I feel really bad about the Lexington because they were all over the news. Very, it's the last place you expect to be being. Yeah, up it's, really nice. it's a really nice place. Yeah, I, yeah, it's a lovely place. You didn't yeah, expect yeah. someone with quite literally a house full of neo-Nazi memorabilia to be turning up and yeah. um, looking for lefties to game yeah. back. But in terms of, yeah, I mean, it, I, I did feel a bit moved in the film. Partly, I think we're all on an emotional edge seeing people in pods laughing, yeah. drinking. Yeah, you know, very natural, non contrived humor, people not having to socially distance. In terms of comedy, I want to talk about this. You, you mentioned the culture war, I think it's really interesting because, and I remember by the way, I, I think I might have said this last time we chatted, I interviewed you about three years ago in a different world. Um, I one of my fun teenage memory was your Radio One show, uh, it was on a Monday evening, I think. Was it? Yeah. Monday? It was. Yeah, with me, me and Richard Herring, that was. It was, and yeah, it was yeah, after, yeah. I was like 12 or 13. Yeah. It was after my, it was after I was supposed to go to bed. And I had this little kind of transistor radio. And I'd I'd always, every Monday, I remember this, I'd line bed and I had to turn the volume down so they couldn't hear it. I'd have to pretend to be asleep. Every single, I'm not joking. It was the highlight of my week. 
We know it's that's one of the, most, the nicest things I've ever heard. Because you know, when you that's how I used to listen to the radio when I when I was twelve, and the idea that you that it was somehow illicit and that you've helped to make something that someone consumed in that way is is a, a delightful. So thank you. Uh, no, no, yeah. I remember the batteries went once, and that was that was my highlight of my week. Right, really. Yeah, yeah. You couldn't go back in those days and listen to no, you couldn't, no, shows no. you'd missed unless you'd recorded it on a cassette or something. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. so in terms of the culture, there's this at the moment, it's kind of one of the fronts of the culture war is so-called woke comedians at the BBC. Yeah. And I suppose in a way, they're kind of, the right and the Tories, if they were going to be emblematic of the sort of comedian that they kind of put, make a demonic figure, they'd probably think you, wouldn't they? Well, they do. They do. But the clever ones, um, they then try to say... But I'm all right. Stuart Lee's all right because he's, you know, he's actually not just parroting. You know, they, they try to sort of then go one further and make out that, that they're not just against people because of their politics or against them because of quality or you know whatever. But they, there's sort of this other thing happening now. But the, what, we have to be careful discussing the the the, the uh, BBC's um, attitude to so-called woke comedians because actually the debate about about it, like so many of these things, was entirely fabricated by the right. Uh, in the week that the um, that uh, the new uh, guy took over, Davy. Uh, was that his name, Tim Davy? Yeah. Uh, it, it was. He was expected that uh, that week he would make some announcements about the direction of the BBC. On the Monday of that week, uh, the the Telegraph, I think it was, uh, ran a story from an unnamed source within the BBC who said that uh, Davy was expected to clamp down on um, woke uh, left leaning comedy and that there was uh, that it was all biased and whatever then this story really took off and by tuesday or wednesday because of the telegraph's unnamed source uh people like me were being uh, rung up by podcasts and news sources and whatever uh, to comment on it and i remember saying specifically to the to the times that i wasn't going to comment on it until we saw whether it was actually true because these things have a habit of not being true, don't they? Whether it's about the statues or the National Trust or whatever, there seem to be these unnamed sources who are happy to talk to the Telegraph that then turn out to say things which don't can't be attributed to anyone and don't have any relationship to what then actually happened. So by the middle of that week, there was this whole culture war being fought. Nish Kumar, as usual, was being used as a political football in it. Um, and... Uh, uh, and it had it really kicked off. Then on the Thursday, um, so there was all this stuff about these news stories about how the woke comedians were going to be clamped down or whatever. On the Thursday, the new uh, director did a, 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 an internal speech uh, to the BBC, which was only um, available on the BBC's in-house um, you know, broadcasting network uh, about what his intentions were. Um, I managed to hack into it. Um, because I am like Sauron and I uh, control everything. <laughs> and I, um, and I, uh, I heard a journalist say to him, are you going to clamp down on left-wing comedians? He said, I've no idea where this story came from. He said, um, and uh, of course there will be more criticism of the government from satirists at the moment because the government are the people that are in power. So inevitably they're going to be... Um, uh, they're going to be criticised, but it but it was too late because by then the made up culture war story had been placed, and the, the the Tories have a number of attack dogs that they put out there with these fabricated stories. Ben Bradley, until recently, was a fairly useful uh, mouthpiece for all this kind of bollocks, but he seems to have overshot his bolt recently. Um, you know, and uh, th this is this is how they do. And it was, you know, they 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 do it. They on the day uh, this week, when when uh, Boris Johnson was talking about the need for people to be more uh, kind and considerate and whatever, uh, some other uh, Jenna was out there um, making up stuff about the statues issue uh, to do with um, t talking about commemorations of slavers, and he was using the usual stupid terminology about the woke arati and whatever. And, um, you know, the, the best thing to do with these things, I mean, here we are talking about it, but the best thing to do with them is to completely ignore them and the people that try to say them and not engage with them at all. Because what they're trying to do by making up these stories and putting them out there through their mouthpieces like the Telegraph is to provoke you into responding in some way. 
And if if, if they can provoke you to respond in a, an angry way, then you become a caricature of the angry black man or the uppity black woman or the miserable left winger or whatever. And that gets snipped out and circulated around. And um, I, I, I admire the restraint with, with, with which when you're on those newspaper review shows, Owen, and I know you have to do them because for a commentator like you, it's your, it's your bread and butter, but, but, but to, to, to avoid being wound up because that's what they want. They fabricate the culture war, they make up the story, and then they want someone like you to say something unguarded about it because they've been wound up. And this is a strategy. And it's a strategy they've learned from Trump, and it's a strategy that the Boris Johnson government in the Cummings era pioneered. They may now be trying to pull back from it. In fact, what uh, Boris has done is he's done a very Trump-like thing, which is to employ a spokesperson, Allegra Stratton, as a firewall between him and the press. Although now... (laughs) The job of this Trump-like spokesperson appears to be having to deny that Boris is like Trump, <laughs> which is really funny given the the reason she's been hired is because somebody obviously thought that worked for Trump, but he had this sort of succession of sort of not nicely turned out women <laughs> lying for him. So, <laughs> you know, but I mean, I don't know how you stand it. I, that's why I could, if I were to go on. Um, question time or something and i'm asked to do these things i would set back the cause of liberal <laughs> politics in britain by about 20 years because i'd end up punching someone in the face so i don't know how you how you do it really punch a wall before you go on television right, okay really yeah very soon yeah, yeah I mean, i'm glad you mentioned nish kumar because he d- protects nish kumar at all costs uh, <laughs> yeah he, they always and they always go for him it's, it just shows again a lot of it they go yeah. they go for people of color in particular yeah uh, they go for women it's grim yeah. i mean on that the culture war thing i find it difficult because in terms of the kind of when people talk about a culture war what i always think it means in practice is very unpleasant people in the right-wing media saying very unpleasant things about minorities who don't have a big voice in the media. Yeah. And then it's a case of, you know, I mean, I think, look, the minority, because I have them, you know, I'm a gay, I'm a gay man. In the 80s and onwards, obviously, and today, gay people are just like, we just kind of want to just get on with our life without, you know, being scared of being beaten up if we hold yeah. hands in the streets. And yeah. obviously, we had lots of laws that were, you know, rigged against us, uh, discrimination, couldn't have a civil partnership, adopt, all the rest of it. Um, and but it's always spun when minorities are just saying, could our lives just be okay and yeah. not have to deal with this relentless crap all the time. And the other thing is, is how it's, it's become counterbalance to working class people. You know, I grew up in the center yeah. of Stockport with in a work, work in a working class community, though I'm not working a working class hero either. Uh, but I grew up with people, and obviously, working class people aren't just white men in the mid 1950s uh, in the mid 50s with socially conservative views. No, uh, working class people can be gay. They can yeah. be black, obviously. And yeah. I think that's the issue, isn't it? It's, it's on the one hand, it's kind of Basically, their view is with the cult, they're waging a culture war, um, yeah. and and if minorities ever try and deign to respond, then it's a case yeah. of you're the well, one you know, waging the culture war. This is, de- this is deliberate, you know. It's a deliberate attempt to frame it as a conflict between all ordinary decent people and all these gays and black people <laughs> and woke karate <laughs> and artists and you know my my um. My my uh, wife Bridget will, will get attacked online as being for being some sort of for being an example of a university educated middle class liberal, and she isn't university educated and isn't middle class and comes from a large working class family whose parents worked in manual labour. But the assumption, but her position in the culture war is only understandable to these binary uh, arguments that you know she must be uh, m- must be of that, and this assumption is made, and it's um. You know, it's 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 crazy to make these um the, the to, to 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 how we were allowing this to happen, and it and it it it, it worked in the states. We've seen where that ended up, and uh, we need to pull back from it. Um, you know, uh, but obviously as a comedian, I um I, I you know I, I worry that on some level the comedy part of me contributes to that because I um you know I like to take extreme positions in in comedy. I'm not um you know the job of the comedian isn't to be this reasonable person sort of having these thoughtful discussions but um 
when I'm talking to you, I can be <laughs> I can be normal. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I, I like the idea so as a comedian, it's like, well, actually be careful about what you joke about because you've got to think about the societal impact. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not really how comedy yeah, well, works. You get this, you know, you get like, you used to get attacked for things you'd said. Now you get attacked for um, things you haven't said. Like you might do a joke about sausages or something. And so I want to put, when are you going to do a joke about the, the paedophile gangs in the north <laughs> of England? You know, it's like every time you kind of just... It's like you you have to sort of append that to everything you, you like, do. And now we joke about, yeah. I mean, on that, isn't that the problem with this debate? I mean, I, I, as you said, it's not something we should all generally be drawn into as a discussion. But right-wing comedy isn't isn't the problem. I mean, I think Have I Got News For You's producer is a conservative, or one of them is, and said the problem is, isn't that we don't try and get right-wing comedians, it's they're just generally not that funny i do think there's an exception jeff norcott i've met i've interviewed him i think he's quite funny but isn't the problem that it's a lot of it is punching down well this, it gets punch- discussed in these terms you know and that was that was a, a, a phrase i think uh, chris rock coins although again if you were to go back and look at some of chris rock stuff from when he started out certainly attitudes to sexuality are a bit breathtaking now but um yeah i i don't know i mean uh, on the whole, there hasn't been a good right wing stand up, and I, I, when I wrote about that a long time ago, now I, I tried to think of it in terms of um, clowning, and that on on some level, the cl- you know a stand up isn't the same as a columnist. It's not the same as Jeremy Clarkson writing a column or Rod Liddle writing a column. Um, a a, a stand up is a, a live thing. Um, and it's like a, it's a clown. It's an archetype of, of, of that of that kind of comedy. And the clown, on some level, has to be a sympathetic figure, normally a tragic figure, on some level. And so, because of the way the world is stacked, uh, uh, um, a, a, lib- a liberal comedian or a comedian complaining about social injustice or whatever um, is always going to be a tragic figure on some on some level. And I thought this is one of the great things about Jeremy Hardy is that. It, it, the the gulf between what he wanted and what we were given was so vast that he was never going to be anything other than an unhappy, alienated man. And so I think that made him a sympathetic character. Um, and uh, but um, whereas the, the, when when the right appear to control everything and, get, and to be able to get what they want, it's hard for them to fulfil that archetype. Mm. I think there will be better right wing comedians in the future because what, at the moment, the, the ones that are getting exposure aren't great. And some people, are, I think, are aligning themselves more with the libertarian cause or the right, because actually now um, the uh, cowed BBC is desperate to get them on to show that it's got balance. So there may actually be a career incentive in uh, going that way. And once people, it's a bit like when people used to say, there were no, uh, you know, particularly good acts from particular minorities in or in any area of life. Um, once you put some out there, then people from those um, areas uh, of society think, oh yeah, we can do this. You know, so I suppose what I'm saying is that, um, you know, <laughs> it's sort of they're not. <laughs> they're not <laughs> it's a bit like encouraging. <laughs> No, I can't. I can't but anyway, it's um, it, you know, it will start to it will start to to turn. Um, but now it's now it's definitely a career move. It's a career move to be of the right. It was. I always thought it was weird that the the BBC got blamed for this um, uh, perceived bias in in comedy because um, because uh, you know, in the in the nineties um, that they ha- the BBC was made to hand over lots of its production to production companies, you know, and they they source the comedy from these production companies. So who is on our screens is largely decided by two or three large production companies that provide the uh, the comedy uh, to the BBC. And the BBC haven't been told it had to do that in the interests of a level level playing field. So um, and those companies only they have no morality. Um, the you know I mean something like. Uh, um, Phil McIntyre is as happy to tour Nish Kumar as it is Douglas Murray. You know, it doesn't have um, a, a morality or a, or a political position. Um, so they just put together things that they thought would sell. And, uh, you know, the market will decide. And um, you can you can criticise me as much as you like, but the fact is a quarter of a million people will 
come and see me live and I'm not on TV all the time, you know, now. Um, so, you know, the, the market is there. In fact, even Farage said that when um, Paul Nuttles from UKIP was saying that Johnny and the Baptists, who are a great, funny, left-wing, satirical musical act who get no TV exposure and will bring a house down if you go and see them and leave you feeling like you're walking on air. Um, uh, uh, he, he wanted them to not be able to play any publicly funded venues because they d had a song making fun of UKIP. Um, and Nigel Farage waited in, and this was after UKIP had had a, an old school uh, right wing racist comedian at one of their events and said that, you know, the market had to decide, which is quite interesting. He was cleverer than, <laughs> he was cleverer than Paul Nuttall. Paul Nuttall. Uh, Paul yeah. Hard to remember now, isn't it? I did. Forgotten. Yeah. They, forgotten leaders of UKIP. They, they get through about one increasingly unhinged leader yeah. every six months now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With like, and they've because you can check them up on Twitter. They're just like random trolls off Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. But on that, isn't the thing with right wing comedy, and it kind of reflects, I think, the trajectory of a lot of the kind of populist right, where they've basically become like a guy coming up and burping in your face and going, ah, did that disgust you? Yeah. It, it, as in, they're yeah. constantly obsessed with. You know, uh, you know, they sort of parlor this alternative to Twitter. Yeah. And the reason it did get shut down, but I think one of the reasons it didn't work is they actually feed off what they think is the perceived yeah. defense of the left. Is, you actually, know, you can almost imagine a talk radio presenter soon torturing a, a kitten <laughs> live on air and going, ah, offended. Do you know what I mean? It has to come well, actually, there. there was a really good um sketch about this in in the in the weirdly, I I I liked a lot of the performers on um the, uh, the 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 daily mash was that what it was called yeah yeah uh, and um but, uh, but I don't really like the format I don't really like people sitting behind desks and reading things out um uh but the the last series under under lockdown they had to kind of cobble it together like this you know down people's uh, webcams and there was a great thing on it uh, making fun of exactly that kind of thing of like oh have I offended you and it was like some Columnist, I think he was called Uncle Disgusting or something like that, and he, all his things were about trying to uh, get a shock out of you. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it is like that, and it, it, once it happens in a vacuum, it's kind of um, it's kind of irrelevant. People were very excited that I was going to speak to you, and and in terms of suggested questions, am I going to lie by saying what happens if you say your English these days didn't come up a lot? It did. People kept asking me to put that to you. As so, well asking as that, me about what? About oh, uh, what happens if you say you're English these days? Oh yeah, right. <laughs> um, that was that was you know that was another thing. That's kind of that was just I'm so I'm. That's part of the problem with lockdown is I love going out and about and talking to people and um because I'm not like a household name. You people are. will just well, right. look. Most people don't know and will recognise me. You know. Um, or I think that's just because people off the telly don't always look like you expect. Anyway, carry on. Yeah, well, they don't at the moment anyway. But um, I, I, I miss talking to people. And I get so many funny ideas from things people say. And that, they say you're English. Uh, if you say you're English, you get put in jail. I mean, that, that, was, that, was in a, 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 that was in a black cab coming back from a late night gig. It was the, it was, and that, that conversation happened from um, Balls Pond Road. <laughs> to a Stoke Newington Church Street, a long Albion road. And I, the devil's advocate, you know, about a quarter of the way into it, I thought, what does he actually mean? You know, and really, um, the people write the stuff for you, you know, like Paul, the, 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 the thing of mine that Asian Dub Foundation sampled, which was the New Year number one pop pickers in sales charts uh, coming over here, that was just basically a transcript of some <laughs> stuff Paul Nuttall had said. Just exaggerated a bit, so I kind of feel a bit. He should get a credit, really. He should get a credit for the right. You know, it's become one of the main. It's become one of the main memes on the internet. It just it will. It, yeah. It's become the new Godwin's law. Sooner or later, every right. conversation on the internet will end up with. So do you, you blah blah blah? You get blah, arrested. Blah, blah, you get arrested just to yeah. say you're English, and people yeah. they finish the line. There's what? a scarf of it. Did you know that someone did a scarf of it? There's a football <laughs> scarf of it. Which I have nothing to do with, and like I was doing something, and someone, oh, I've bought your scarf. I went, what? <laughs> they thought I'm like a, a scarf millionaire now. But there's a, it looks like an England football scarf, and it's got. If you say you're English, you get thrown in jail these days. It's got the judge from the Monopoly board going like that on it. 
I actually found the bloke on the internet, and I went, you know, I'll, I don't mind, but, you know, give me some, I'll sell them at gigs or something. Yeah, I know, exactly. At least get some commission out of it. Yeah, um, know, yeah, yeah. The, the more serious question. What sta- someone asked, what state will live comedy in the arts more generally be in after the pandemic? Cheerful well, question. I don't know. It's terrible, isn't it? I mean, we were t- I was just about this this morning, you know. I mean, I'm okay. I uh, I came down halfway through a tour, um, and, I, you know, I'm... I'm, I've got somewhere to live. I'm fine, right? But um, the the in, in stand up, m- most people um, operate. Most people operate on um, very tight margins. Most people that are working comics work four or five nights a week in rooms in the back of pubs, and they make a living out of it. You know, but those have all gone. I know people have been able to apply for furlough if they can show what they've made but it doesn't re- really always work like that event some of the venues have been propped up some good venues um probably run by the sort of people that don't understand the the kind of language that you have to use to apply for funding have not been helped out we'll definitely uh lose a generation of people and we'll lose a generation particularly of the sort of t- talents and voices we were talking about at the start um, people that don't have a fallback position or haven't got family money to support them. Um, that's in comedy. Um, my w- one, of, one of my worries was that the sort of production companies that manage acts, uh, book tours, and um, make television programs would try and acquire venues. Therefore, you know, uh, that you then had to be with them to play them. Therefore, it further narrowing the filter that g- gives access to different kinds of voices. So it's not. I don't think it's looking good. We'll see what happens on the other side. I um have you know I've been trying for a year now to schedule runs of gigs in smaller venues so that they get the door money, um uh you know to give them the door to to keep them open. But those obviously keep being pulled. And they, you know they had the ticket money, which is good. But so we'll see. M- music is an even worse position mm. because a lot of musicians um make money doing teaching or whatever on the side that's all uh will have gone down and also if you look back over the history of your favorite mid scale to unknown bands over the last 45 years since we joined the eu you'll find they like the fall have got a you know live in zagreb album you know i mean like touring europe economically uh became a, a real lifeline for those sorts of groups um and uh it shows it's absolutely naive of um, the Tories to, to uh, and of Roger Daltrey particularly, who I'm really, really angry with, to think that um, that that um, the, the lack of uh, freedom of movement for artists after Brexit will not poll like that. And people just won't. I've got a relative whose um, whose uh, grandson is um, uh, at, 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 you know, at music college. And, and uh, she, she's a Brexit voter. And uh, I just brought this up and I didn't even mean anything by it. I said, of course, it would be very difficult because he, uh, if he's a touring musician, he won't have access to, um, to uh, you know, being able to do all these European shows. And people just go silent. They, they've got nothing. They can't come up with anything. And, yeah, it's awful. Um, and we'll miss it, you know. We'll miss it. Um, and hopefully people will be able to, to claw something back. So, yeah, for those who don't know, Roger Roger Daltrey, of course, criticised restrictions of musicians touring Europe after voting for Brexit. It reminds me of the um, uh, the woman who voted for the leopards who eat faces party saying, "But I didn't know they'd eat my face." Yeah, well, I mean, um, those those stories are. I mean, they're, they're anecdote. The, the stories of people that voted for Brexit only to find it makes their own lives impossible are, you know, they're ice they're. At the moment, there are a cluster of isolated anecdotal stories, and to be fair, we don't. It's too soon to say what they add up to, but it's difficult to avoid the dramatic irony of it. You know, one can't even take pleasure in um, the Schadenfreude of Daltrey because it's so irritating. But he's always been like that. I mean, he he runs. Um, you know, he does the uh, Teenage Cancer Trust, and yet he was a UKIP voter at the time when Paul Nuttall... He's been talked about more <laughs> on this than he has for about five years, but Paul Nuttall wanted to shut down the NHS and sell it all off. So it's just absolutely... The bloke's an idiot, right? And um, he should keep his mouth shut because he every time he opens it, he causes ma- massive damage to people's futures and livelihoods. Um, but, you know, I mean, 
it's just pathetic. It's absolutely pathetic. And you got this clip of him doing the rounds, shouting down a reporter in 2019 who's asking him about touring under Brexit. And now he's signing the agreement. That agreement should be changed. That the government <laughs> should um, make it possible for all musicians to tour Europe, except Roger Daltrey, who has to live in a rabbit hutch now, <laughs> singing I Hope I Die Before I Get Old over and over again on a loop in a little rabbit hutch in a forest. You know, but, um, <laughs> you know he's flying it with a mod target drawn on it. You know, it's just. I like the way. Started a row with Roger Daltrey and resuscitated <laughs> poor Nuttall's career. It's going well. Just yeah. the final, final part, final part. We'll see if we can end on a hopeful note somehow. But it doesn't just... But I mean, Trump's gone. That's that's a bonus. You've got to take what yeah. you can in the... Yeah. Semi you know, I was watching that last night. I must admit, morbidly, I was... I was, I was going to talk to someone online last night, and I went, well, do you mind if I don't? Because I want to watch the riots happening live on uh, the news, but there weren't really any. But, you know, if, if you're um, a champagne socialist like me, there's all sorts of things you can pick apart about um, Biden's voting record, um, you know, and, uh, the, uh, and the various things he's said and done over the years, and things about American politics that he's enabled that you don't necessarily like. But, God, what a relief, you know. I mean, it is like a horrible cloud has lifted and it's yet to be seen what happens but you know it was it was very very moving to see the changing of the guard last night even in those bizarre circumstances yeah i mean that's what i think i mean in a way it's it's, it's breathing space and yeah whatever and i do have i've got major problems with it i mean even as vice president when they were obviously fighting each other for the nomination yeah right, back, uh, past association with racists but even for example the muslim ban being repealed the paris yeah. accords on climate change and that's the existential threat facing humanity these things yeah. matter and have you seen that ted cruz has tried to spin um explain that. It. tell everyone tell everyone yeah oh, you it's, played right yeah okay right yeah, yeah. No, no no go on tell them, tell, well, them, tell them ted cruz has tried to spin the, the paris uh rejoin the paris agreement he sent out a tweet that suggests that he thinks or was deliberately chosen to misunderstand that it's something to do, it was an agreement negotiated by the citizens of Paris on their behalf and that Biden um, prefers the, the citizens of Paris to blue collar workers in um, in uh, energy industries in America. And it's, you know, it, and I think Ted Cruz knows that that's not the case, but is doing what we were talking about earlier, which is trying to inflame a culture war that pits uh, what blue collar America not only uh, against black people and artists and gays, but against just French people. Generally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, surrender monkeys, I think they're called them. Yeah, it's yeah. Like the views of the citizens of Paris more than the jobs of the citizens of Pittsburgh. What yeah. are you talking about, Ted Cruz? Yeah, it doesn't yeah. make any sense. Yeah, in terms of Britain, then finally, I mean, obviously, we've got the hardest possible Brexit with consequences you've already described yeah. um the Tories have quite a big majority i suppose what my concern is looking at the polling i mean look like over a hundred thousand people are dead the country is in a complete and utter state we've had one of the worst affected countries on earth yeah they've still got a polling lead and i just kind of ask is that you know to what extent, i mean well you know even that, even um peter oborn uh you know wrote, wrote a piece during the last um uh, phase of of uh, campaigning about the uh, the press and the media being stacked against the Labour Party generally and against Corbyn specifically, um, and um, uh, you know it's a hard thing to get by. You know we we're uh, um, we've we've all watched um, uh, Prime Minister's questions where uh, Keir Starmer uh, is able to ask you know. The, the sort of logical questions to to Boris Johnson that anyone could ask, really, <laughs> um, and yet uh, his rubbish answers to them rarely make the news. Um, I think it is a it's a struggle against um against the biased media. Um, I mean, when um when Sky Arts wanted to buy uh, um, King Rocker, the old part of me was thinking well it's sky you know and murder owns these shares in it and whatever and i always had i, I actually turned down um a, a better sky deal financially to to do work with the bbc in in the noughties because i 
thought it was more moral in some way and yet the guy that's been put in charge of the bbc now is a bloke who's donated four hundred thousand pounds to the conservative party and is um uh involved with those tufton street right-wing think tanks that seem to be invited on everything and are utterly unaccountable though i don't really know um you know i don't really know how you overcome that uh, and i mean the, the transparency of the fact that uh, Bo Bo boris johnson has made allegra stratton his spokesperson and then her own husband is getting front page news stories placed that he's written about how great boris is you know it's just it's a it's a, a terrible um uphill struggle you know it, it it may be that the more renegade um uh voices on the right like um uh that uh, talk radio station that julia hartley brewer does that n now they won't carry some of their clips on youtube it may be that they are reined in because we've seen what's happened with trump but again that won't be a moral decision it will just be um uh, platforms like YouTube or Twitter thinking that they don't want to be held legally accountable if violence is stirred up um, by those sorts of commentators uh, which is all that's happened with with Trump on on uh, on um, Twitter it's not it's not a moral decision it's just that they don't they don't want someone suing them if uh, someone's killed in a, in a riot that Trump has instigated but you know we'll, we'll see I just think it's an up it's an uphill battle against a, a biased media and yet the and yet the the culture has managed to spin the idea that um, that uh, you're, you're getting a, a liberal biased media. Let's finally then let's see if we can end on a hopeful note. I mean, I mean, I'm interested vaguely. What do you think of Labour's new management, Keir Starmer? But also, in pandemic ravaged conservative Britain, what hope do you have? Cheer people up if you can. I mean, be honest if you can't. Well, um. I think that the that some good it, it's yet to be seen how America resolves the divisions that have been stoked there but um I, I think there's a sort of nervousness now um amongst some people uh, on the right about using trumpian tactics we'll see how long it lasts certainly it may it's made no difference to um a, a lot of people um you know you know i i don't i don't know i mean when and it's like you said um the the the, the 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 it seems that just when you think it can't get any worse it does and um you know i i uh, and it's 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 difficult. It's intimidating. I mean, I, I'm I am not as a, as visible a, a political commentator as I might be because w with the little that I do do, um, the uh, amount of shit I get and 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 it is often unmanageable. And I worry about how it impacts on my my family and my children. And I don't know personally how you cope with it and we know that for you there have been um you know actual physical criminal consequences and uh, which were dismissed at the time that you were attacked by commentators on the right as fabricated or hysterical and um uh you know when, whenever whenever someone says my name in the street my immediate reaction is to be very suspicious because I worry about where it's going, you know, and so it's 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 a scary time to want to comment on things or to want to make a difference. Uh, I don't know what will happen. I don't know if the you know will will the people that were angry enough about the world to want to vote for Brexit be even more angry when they realise that they were lied to, which they surely must do uh, when you have people like Jacob Rees-Mogg dismissing the concerns of fishermen that he previously weaponized out of hand in such a facetious way. Uh, I, I just don't know. I, I'm glad I haven't got to write the rewrite of the hour of the touring show right now because I feel like we're in flux and I don't know where things are going. Yeah, no, I'm just but look, I've got all these CDs. 
So I'm all I know. Right. I was going to say that's yeah. a lot of CDs. You've got all those books. It'll be all right, won't we? I find it depressing now that if if you're like ten, you won't know what a CD is, maybe or a cassette. Yeah. These are alien, increasingly alien concepts. But yeah. yeah, you got on that. You know, just finally. I mean, I was just. I, it, it, that's why I get angry. The point you made about the media, because when I got veered up by a man with a house full of Combat Eighteen and. SS flags. It's really funny when you say that. I mean, I'm glad you. I'm glad you've seen the funny side of it because it's sort of to, that sentence is to, to have gone through saying, "Oh, he's made he's made it up." He probably punched himself in the face. They did to get what, sympathy. <laughs> like, the funniest bit of the trial. I don't think I've ever discussed this because it made me because obviously you've got to find humor in all these things. But when, he was such a pathetic guy as well. Honestly, he was so. Yeah, I know it's sad, isn't it? Yeah. He was like this forty-year-old loser, and I just thought. Yeah. But he brought in his former housemate, and they must have practiced this line beforehand, yeah. uh, because they they, they said uh, to his housemate, "Would you, would you trust the defendant?" He said, "Yes, absolutely. In fact, so much so that if I had an attractive girlfriend and I went to bed and I left him chatting with her, I would trust him not to sleep with her." I was like, <laughs> "I was like that." baseline of trust yes. <laughs> you wouldn't have sex with your girlfriend yeah yeah, yeah. But i just get annoyed about the right because i that was the culmination normally in the streets everyone's very nice to me even people yeah. go i don't always agree with you i get that but yeah yeah yeah, I actually, yeah no that's a nice one isn't it i don't always agree with you but i well, i really right. like yeah. that about people and I, and I like i like i like being able to say that to people because <laughs> it makes yeah. me feel like i'm a reasonable bloke exactly and they go because sometimes they'll get you a pint or whatever. But yeah, what yeah. annoys me is when you know that when I got attacked, it was the culmination. I kept having Tommy Robinson fans around Westminster trying to get yeah, yeah. me in the face. Yeah. And it's the fact it's the right wing media who've whipped them up. They've been yeah. when we talk about Islamism, we talk about who are the hate preachers who radicalize fundamentalist, yeah, fundamentalist Islamism um, of the terrorist bent. But who are the hate preachers radicalizing these people? And it's anyway, yeah. Well, well, you know, I mean, I I have got friends and relatives who I can only explain their change of heart in uh, and their drift towards the right and the far right in terms of they've been radicalized and I know who radicalized them and what websites they were looking at and I know that it's impossible uh, to meet them now and um yeah and and we would if if those views had come from um from Islamism uh, or from Abu Hamza, we would say they've been radicalized. Simple as that. But, you know, people are starting to understand that, I think. I hope so. Sure, we've taken up way too much of your time. That was a huge, huge honor. Uh, well, it was really, really nice for me. Yeah. And I, 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 re I really, uh, you know, I don't always agree with what you say. I really like, I, I think it's really, um, it's really valuable. And I, 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 I um, admire your patience when you're on those uh I'm, I'm one of these news junkies that sits up and i i always watch what's on the, the papers reviews and i admire the, the patience with which you um you handle. i've actually got to the point with those though where there's people if someone from those tufton street think tanks comes on i just won't watch it i, I don't want to hear their bought lies you know and um so uh Anyway, but thank you for having no, me. No, 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 thank you. I just go to my happy place. Uh, oh, I... Honestly, it's uh, it is a it's a massive honour, and I know people are going to be very thank excited you. and listen to this. Thank you so much, Europe. Thanks for having us. Cheers. We're never going to succeed in radicalising politics and doing what must be done on behalf of the many if we do not challenge the dominance of the establishment media uh, with our own media. So support Owen Jones's team on Patreon.